Hello and welcome to the big picture. The nine-day visit of Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi to France, Germany and Canada beginning today will be watched with a great deal of interest across the world. Prime Minister Modi during his last 11 months in office has made many visits abroad, with focus being on the East and Pacific nations. This has led to an impression that India was ignoring the West European countries. This visit should be able to erase that impression. The visit is now being dubbed in some parts of Europe as India's or Modi's link West policy. Two of the most significant parts, France and Germany, have been major parts which can offer India many things in several areas, while India can also offer some key requirements to them. Modi's visit to Canada also has a lot of significance as he will be the first Indian Prime Minister to visit there on a bilateral, on, on a bilateral visit in more than four decades. So today we will look at this major visit to the Indian Prime Minister and what it has to offer to the countries he is visiting and from them to India. To discuss this, I have with me Amarnath Ram, former Secretary, Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India, Professor Gulchan Sachdeva, Centre for European Studies at the Centre for European Studies at the JNU, TCA Rangachari, former ambassador to both France and Germany, P. Stopdan, Senior Fellow, Institute for Defence Studies and Analysis and Pramit Pal Chaudhary, Foreign Affairs Editor, Hindustan Times. Welcome to all of you. Mr. Ram, is this some kind of a, is this impression which had, which had gained that, you know, India was a little ignoring the Western countries or these West European countries? Was that the right impression? Was it that this government had given too much uh, importance to the look east or act east and also the US and at the cost of uh, uh, Europe? I don't think so. I mean, let's look at Prime Minister's visits in the past few months uh, since he assumed office. The first ones, of course, to Bhutan, Nepal, the neighboring countries, SARC. Then, of course, the circle was expanded and it uh, covered uh, the Asia-Pacific countries. Now, it was natural for him to look at these three countries, which, don't forget, are a direct uh, part of his overall outreach program, diplomatic outreach program. All these three countries are members of the G8, members of the G20, they are the world's major economies. Prime Minister's focus obviously has been on economic issues, on economic cooperation. The fact that we have neglected visiting these countries in the past on a regular basis, even though we have had summit-level dialogue arrangements with uh, the European Union, for example, which has not materialized in the last year or so, uh, would suggest that the Prime Minister's focus now is to, to fill in that void in the total... Uh, uh, coverage that we are giving in our international relations to our friends and partners. So I think it is not neglect, it is really making good on something which he has always believed in, that is to expand our economic outreach, strategic outreach to friends in Western Europe and in North America who could cooperate with us in the coming years in our fulfilling our national priorities. Toda, you think that, you know, the previous government had... Was there a problem in dealing with these West European nations by, by the, by the pre, uh, previous government? And, you know, what were the reasons? No, I don't think uh, this was a problem. But uh, what I think is that this time, this has been very carefully conceptualized, a visit to Europe. Where you rightly said that uh, he first went to East. This is where the economic growth is taking place. There is no economic growth in Europe. <laughs> So you have to prioritize. The East is important from that point of view, and the West is important from the technology point of view. So this, this visit is about technology, modernization, industrialization. So this is a program, it's a partnership in that regard. So the countries themselves are not important. It's the theme which is very important. I think th this is why this visit is very significant. Okay, well, Mr. Rangachari, uh, one of the... one. One of the, you know, when, when this visit was being planned, in, India and the Prime Minister were very keen to go to Brussels also and, you know, have... But there was some problem there as far as the East European Union is concerned. <clears throat> well, let me first get back to the point that you made about uh, having, quote-unquote, neglected. Yes. If we go back a few months on the way to Brazil for the BRICS summit, the Prime Minister had stopped in Germany. And at the time when that stopover was taking place, was to take place, at the planning stage, there was a possibility of a meeting with the Chancellor. Chancellor, which did and not so happen. happened that the dates of his visit coincided with the World Cup football. football. 
and Germany <laughs> won the football. <laughs> Germany got into the finals and Angela Merkel went to watch that match. So, I don't think it is right to fault the government <laughs> for uh, not having tried to fix the meeting. Uh, that was attempted and it didn't work out. So, I don't think neglect is, is, would, be, would be a right way of looking at this. Germany and France both remain important for us. You asked about Brussels. Yes, there were some reports, but I have not seen anything from official sources either from the Indian side or from the side of the European Union as to what exactly the purpose of that planned visit would have been and if that was not taking place, why it was not taking place. And in any case, insofar as the European Union is concerned, as of now, it's Germany and France, which are the important drivers in the European Union. And uh, hopefully the kind of views that would be expressed and discussed between the two sides would have a very important bearing on whatever view and whatever uh, approach that the European Union itself take towards India. In any case, uh, if I might add one more sentence, the currently the European Union is grappling so much with the crisis in the Eurozone that I'm not sure to what extent they have the capability to take new initiatives in so far as India is concerned. Uh, of course, if they would, that would be very welcome because India has always, to my mind, dealt with the European Union as also the partner countries who are part of the European Union as good friends, as stable friends, and has tried to develop relationship in a multifaceted way in all of these uh, countries. So if the European Union and India, that is European Union as European Union, you know, not simply as bilateral relationships with the major countries of Europe, if that as an organization can provide new initiatives in our uh, relationship, I'm sure that would be very welcome in India. Okay, Professor, Professor Sajdeva. How do you look at this? You know, the Brussels, uh, Mr. Rangachari was saying that we don't know whether the, there was any official, uh, you know, attempt to go to Brussels and things like that. But in a, in, a, in a visit like this, you're in Germany, you're in France, Brussels would have been automatically part of, should have been automatically part of that visit. But anyway, there, is a, there seems to be a problem there. But as far as these other two countries are concerned, what is it that India will, will be looking at as far as France and Germany are concerned? Well, you're absolutely right. In fact, if actually uh, along with the, his visit to Germany, France, if there would have been another India-EU summit in Brussels, it would have been actual real focus on Europe because Europe is our uh, very important partner as far as trade, investment, technology, transfer is concerned. Uh, and there has been, uh, I mean, the, you know, the, particularly on the India-EU uh, relationship, there has been a bit of a momentum has been lost in the last one or two years. Uh, and there have been certain problems in Europe. But despite all the problems in Europe and, uh, you know, um, stagnation in growth, still I think their productivity levels are pretty high. They still have a lot of resources. And uh, if one is actually looking that, you know, uh, economics is actually pushing our foreign policy, then perhaps uh, we have somehow, I would say, neglected Europe to some extent for the last one year. Uh, because if you look at all our programs, you look at Make in India, you look at Digital India, you look at uh, Clean Ganga, you look at Renewable Energy, I think European participation and uh, their contribution would be pretty useful. Uh, uh, and so far, I mean, now they, have, uh, they are looking towards India because what they felt that uh, during the UPA2 regime, there was uh, policy paralysis. Uh, and uh, still, in fact, uh, Indian investment has somehow declined in the last couple of years in Europe because of problems in Europe. But European investment to India actually has uh, grown in the last one or two years because what they have seen now, there is a new hope in India. And this is one area where still the growth is happening. Um, so as a biggest uh, trading block and uh, one of the biggest actually uh, players in the, in, even in the services in the global affairs, I think this visit is very useful. Uh, it, they may not be big ticket kind of things are happening immediately, may, uh, particularly with France on uh, whether on the nuclear issues or on uh, aircraft. But I think the sentiment that you know now India is ready for investment and technology from Europe. That's I think the message would be very useful, uh, and I think in that sense visit is very useful. Okay, Pramit, 
Pramit, how do you look at this? You know, when when uh, when Gul, uh, Gulshan talks about uh, some kind of a neglect in the last one year or so, do you think that that is being made up now? And and what is what do you think is the major major uh, thrust of the prime minister for, as far as the prime minister is concerned? Well, as has been mentioned, the Prime Minister's uh, foreign policy has been very tightly converged with his economic policy. And at the heart of that is the revival of manufacturing uh, and the attraction of foreign capital, uh, especially for long-term infrastructure investment. Europe is a player in that, but it is not a big, as big a player as China or Japan. Europe does not have surplus capital. It is the Asian countries which have surplus capital. So it is not unexpected that he would go there to Asia first. Uh, he revived a relationship with America which was under, under trouble, uh, partly because it was important America, because it's simply the sing single largest and most powerful nation in the world still, uh, was in a country that he had to deal with. Europe, uh, there are two parts of the European. One is mentioned as the European Union, which is effectively functions like a multilateral organization as far as India is concerned. Uh, and then there are two or three major European countries that he's, uh, he has interests in. Uh, of these, Germany is by far the most important because, again, when it comes to his economic uh, policies, Germany fits most closely with what uh, Modi is looking for. Manufacturing, Germany is a manufacturing powerhouse among all the European countries. It has by far the most extensive uh, uh, European uh, the manufacturing and infrastructure capacities. Uh, so Germany was always at the heart of what he was most interested in. Uh, France comes in a bit secondary, and of course what's missing here, uh, and one I presume will mean because of the present elections that are coming there, is Britain, uh, which is of course the, the third largest European economy. Uh, that is not visiting in this trip, uh, and presumably because the elections are, are, taking, are about to take place in England, and he'll wait for those elections uh, to be over. Uh, the European Union, however, Modi is not very interested in. Uh, the cans the at attempt to have a summit, we haven't had, I think, an EU-India summit now, I may be wrong, in like two or three years, um, is largely a consequence of the fact that the only real single agenda uh, is the EU-India FTA, uh, which at present is, is, is stalled. Right. Uh, the EU, we couldn't deal with for a while because they were undergoing a change. Their commission, the, the president, everybody in the council uh, was all changed uh, in December. So again, we had to wait uh, for that to happen. And what seems to be the case is that this was canceled simply because the European Union sat on the, sat on the request for one month. Uh, simply because they were tied up, as has been mentioned, with their own domestic crises and the Ukraine crisis. Uh, and as a con after a while, Modi just got impatient and said, okay, we'll cancel it, we'll do this at some other point. Okay, Mr. Ram, you know, it, interestingly, I was reading one of the analysts writing about, you know, Germany being looked at, as far as India is concerned, as some kind of an alternate development model. You think that is something which, which, which will be of interest to watch during this visit? Just a word with your permission. You know, the Europe, uh, I'll, I'll come to this, Germany. Yeah, yeah. The European Union is not the sum total, not the aggregate of its individual members. <laughs> it is a lot more than that. Okay. So I, uh, with due respect, disagree that the European Union is a partner whom we can accord a little lower priority uh, in comparison and then, to... And then deal with this uh, the other countries bilaterally. And bilaterally. Yeah, because there is a common foreign policy now, there is a common uh, economic policy, there's a single market, and I get there are all kinds of things which are happening in Europe which make it necessary for the India-EU FTA to be completed very soon. And I think then it will be appropriate for Prime Minister Modi to pay a visit or alternatively to receive the President of the European Union to India to sign that agreement and the relationship can go forward. But economic component is not the only element there. We have a strategic interest there. Right. The summit level talks with the European Union include issues like terrorism, countering terrorism, right. uh, various other issues. Now, black to, money. And black know. money, <laughs> absolutely. And, and in fact, you know, it's the largest economic package that India has in our economic relations. Approximately 28% of our economic exposure is with the European Union countries. Now, coming to Germany, and a word about France before France. that, and just a word, that, you know, Mrs. Gandhi realized that even during the Cold War years, Europe was the middle power. 
it, it was a part of the Western alliance, but it was not quite a part of the integrated uh, Western military command. And consequently, she developed personal equations with people like Francois Mitterrand, Pompidou. Before that, of course, Pandiji developed with de Gaulle and right. others. Our first economic linkages in Europe were with France, whether right. it was the nuclear issue or space, Vikram Sarabhai, Homi Baba, etc. Now coming to Germany. Germany is not a model that we can replicate for many reasons. Firstly, because Germany has always been a politically very, very diffuse, but nevertheless a cohesive unit. They have had convenient, uh, marriages of convenience in terms of setting up their governments, and who knows this better than Ambassador Rangachari. And consequently, they have worked well because their economic interests override all else. In our case, that doesn't seem to be the case. Even today, even though we are today looking at making a major breakthrough in our economic policies and programs, I don't think we have a national consensus on these issues. Mm. Germany probably has a little more. So I think we'll have to develop our own model, but Germany has to be factored into this as an economic partner, as a technology partner, as a partner in other areas. In manufacturing. Which, and absolutely, absolutely. So still there? This alternate development model. Yeah, but I, I don't think there is a concept of alternative development. There is this thing that which we desire. We may have an alternative development program, but Germany, country like Germany can only contribute to our alternative development, not in the sense that German has a, a alternative development plans, but the kind of technology they have, like clean technology, energy, uh, infrastructure system, transport system, which can actually help our, uh, you know, the, the, the plans for sustainable development. Uh, this is where the modernization partnership is very important, which, you know, the American model is slightly problematic. Uh, even the Chinese model could be problematic. I think it is in that context uh, we are talking about the European uh, alternative uh, you, model. Do, do, you see, do you see some kind of a, a clarity in the mind of the Indian government about this thing and how they approach, how, what kind of approach they'll, they'll be having during this visit? Uh, this is where I think the kind of uh, items on which we are going to focus. This is linked with, say, pollution, mm. uh, clean Ganga, uh, uh, smart cities. All these things are linked with the and bullet kind trains, of, yes, fast exactly, trains. exactly, the infrastructure, <laughs> yeah. and all other issues. I think this visit is basically flows from those you know expectations that we have in our own country. So, Rangachari. As far as both, you know, France and Germany are concerned, you know, what Mr. Ram said and uh, Mr. Stobdan says, how do you look at this? But <clears throat> what is it that India will be looking at and trying to get from them? Well, you know, after more than six decades now, I don't suppose we need to go into the question of how we can reinvent the developmental model mm. that we have been following. Because broadly... If we talk in terms of prosperity for all and inclusive growth, that about covers <clears throat> the requirements insofar as India is concerned. But I think as, you know, as Ram was saying earlier and Mr. Stobden was saying just now, see, for example, take clean energy. Uh, this government, after taking office, has announced a very ambitious target of virtually doing ten times what was targeted in terms of solar energy. Right. There are laws which Germany has passed, very stringent laws. Some of them, of course, are problematic. For example, those relating to nuclear uh, power. Uh, we want to go the nuclear power route and there is still a debate in Germany as to whether that is advisable and Germans have gone one way or another, both ways, on, on this question of whether it is desirable or not. But insofar as the impact of climate change is concerned, if you look at the recent uh, October uh, APEC summit when the United States and China reached a kind of a quote-unquote deal, deal. Europeans have actually entered into binding commitments, which was not the case in the US-China deal. And also, they have undertaken commitments which will take them back from the current levels back to the levels they have set as a base 1990 and so on. Whereas the Chinese so how and the does, Americans where, where were India talking about... Now, where India was coming, I wanted to link it up with the projects like, for example, solar energy. Okay. Now, if you take the total power uh, generation in India, it is about 2.56 gigawatts. Out of which nuclear power provides, according to NPCIL figures, 
only 5,000 megawatts. Right. Now, Jaitapur has been mentioned in press reports about, you know, ongoing negotiations and so on. Now, it is not unusual for nuclear power plant negotiations to go on over a period of time. And, of course, within the country also, there has been a certain degree of uh, uh, disenchantment, shall we say, and protests insofar as uh, setting up a nuclear power plant is concerned. But solar energy is very eminently doable. And if, in fact, with the assistance of not just countries in Europe, but also other partners, as you mentioned earlier, you know, this question of financing, which, which the uh, East, China, Japan, and so on have, in actual terms, India would have done much, much better for climate change and for controlling pollution, environmental degradation, etc., if we were to achieve that target, than any kind of open-ended commitments. So which what, are about, what about what is it that France will be looking at us? What 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 happened? What happened to the nuclear deal with France? And France is actually looking at India to set up some of these nuclear plants here and do you think Indian Prime Minister will be able to make any assurances on that front? But you see, as far as nuclear power is concerned, I just mentioned to you the figures of what is the total, uh, you know, 5,000 megawatts but, percent. But we have seen in this country the kind of debate which has gone on. Uh, governments were about to fall on this whole issue. <laughs> Not just that, yeah. but also question of land acquisition. Yes. That comes in. The land bill is still, uh, you know, at the moment in Parliament, we don't know at yes. what stage it is. Uh, whether it will go, go through or it will not go through. There are issues, but bigger than that is the question of how affordable India will find nuclear, nuclear power, power to be. Price is also one of the issues that one will have to look at. So you don't think that there will be any, any push towards that side from as far as the Indian side is concerned? Or so let even, me put it differently. Even if there is a push, how soon we will be able to get those megawattage <laughs> out of nuclear power remains a question mark. We need the power yesterday. We will not be able to get it, <laughs> right. you know, question mark. Okay, mm -hmm. Professor Jeva, you know, in, in, these two, in these two countries, you know, Canada, we, we are missing Canada also. We need to talk a little bit about what, is, what we can expect from Canada. But quickly, as far as France and Germany is concerned, you think India will be able to, uh, you know, uh, what is it that is on offer for India and what is it that India can offer them? Well, I mean, core of this relationship is still trade and economics. And, uh, and I agree totally with Ambassador Ram that it's not that simple that we can just differentiate European Union and individual member states. I mean, if the core is economics and we are negotiating trade and investment agreement with the European Union, not with the individual member states. At the same time, even if you look at investment, which has actually taken place in India, of course, our relationship with the Asian countries have obviously gone... Uh, you know, much beyond our expectation in some cases. But uh, in the last 15 years, if you see investment which has come to India, European investment to India is much more than the American, Japanese and Chinese investment put together. So it means, I mean, still, you know, if you're looking investment technology, Europe is very, very important. And uh, Europeans are also looking, because if you're opening uh, our areas, particularly the defense technology, and they do have defense technology, particularly in India, with France. And the whole make in India business. Make in India business. And, and, and all, all have shown very, I mean, great interest, particularly uh, Germany and France. And uh, France, in fact, you know, if, if one is looking even the strategic partnerships, if one has to actually, uh, you know, say, rank all the strategic partnerships of India, I would say, uh, you know, uh, India's strategic partnership with France would come immediately after... Indo-Russian and Indo-US strategic partnerships. So it's, it's, you know, it has been a long kind of a kind of relationship we have built over years and kind of understanding. I mean, yes, I mean, Germany is also very important for trade, economics and other things. But on the broader issues, I mean, the issues which were, uh, I think, again, um, identified by Ambassador Ram, I mean, you know, on, the, on the maritime security, uh, like French, they have, you know, certain presence in the Indian Ocean, so we can work with them. There are issues on uh, terrorism. Uh, which, of course, I mean, you have to work mainly in the member state because still the competencies within the European Union are very limited. And there are many other areas, even in the development cooperation, and in many areas, particularly in Africa and other areas, Europeans are active, uh, particularly German and French, they are the biggest players in the development cooperation. So we can work in many, many areas. Uh, okay. And, of course, renewable energy, which, of course, uh, they are important. Okay. Uh, Pramit, you know, as coming to Canada, what is it that 
you know, why has it taken such a long time for Indian Prime Minister to, to, to go on a bilateral visit? Four decades is one hell of a long time. Well, at the, at the heart of it, you have to remember is that Canada effectively boycotted India. Um, we had, Canada was one of the strongest uh, opponents of India's nuclear testing, not only because they felt that the first test, uh, the first Pokhran test, uh, that India had violated its nuclear understanding of Canada because we used a Canadian-based reactor uh, to create some of the, the plutonium that was used for the testing, uh, and responded just as severely uh, in the second test. Um, so they have always been at the heart that for, for many years and many decades they have been at, the, at leaders of the non-proliferation uh, policy and under their foreign minister Axworthy they imposed virtually a complete uh, boycott uh, of India. They did very little with us, as little as possible. Um, and it was actually only with the American nuclear, the US-Indian nuclear deal that we saw Canada turn around and say, okay, we will actually support you uh, in, in getting an exemption from the nuclear suppliers group and the proliferation sanctions that we ourselves had supported in the past. After that, we start to see the relationship change quite dramatically. Um, and in fact, to be fair, I think the Indian side is actually quite surprised that the Canadians turned around uh, uh, so, so drastically. Um, uh, on the nuclear issue. But after that, that opened up a whole, air, a whole set of areas which we could work with the Canadians. Okay. Um, okay. In addition, of course, our own economy as we grew, uh, we now have a lot more interest in their natural resources. And Canada, remember this, by 2030, Indians will be the single largest minority in that country. Absolutely. Uh, this is the new okay. immigration right. frontier for Indians. Right, Mr. Ram. Canada, you know, it's a fascinating uh, what uh, I fully Pramit agree with them. Pramit was talking and what what what, is, what lies ahead. I fully agree with Pramit. In fact, there are three reasons why the Prime Minister's visit to Canada is most timely now. One is, of course, there have been hiccups. Let's forget about the hiccups. Let's look at the future. Canada wields disproportionate influence considering its size and economic strength in the global scene. It's a member of the Commonwealth. It's an economy which is in the G8. Second is... There are 1.5 million Indians right. who live in Canada. And the third is it is rich in natural resources and technology. Right. And I think for these three reasons, India must now uh, certainly look at Canada afresh and build relations for our mutual advantage, of course. Okay. Mr. Rangachari, as far as Canada is concerned, you think overall there will be you know, this, what uh, Pramit was talking about, Indians becoming the second largest or first largest minority in the country. But the Indian community, whether you take it, you know, so, so far as the <clears throat> United States is concerned or in many other countries, Mauritius, for example, Fiji and so on, the Indian community has always played a very significant role in bringing that country closer to India. To that extent, very clearly, the presence of a large Indian minority in a country like Canada, which as Ambassador Ram says, you know, pointed out the many advantages of having closer relations with Canada, would certainly be very helpful. The question is, insofar as natural resources are concerned, to what extent are we in a position to exploit those natural resources? What kind of a trade can be established, you know, established with Canada in those? And how can all that fit in with the way in which we want our economy to grow? Okay. These are questions that we need to talk about. Okay, I think we are completely run out of time, but, but the Indian diaspora in Canada, you know, the huge diaspora in Canada will obviously be waiting for Prime Minister Modi, and maybe we'll see another Madison Square Garden kind of event there. We'll wait and watch how this whole visit will come through, and we'll certainly come back and have a look at what happened during the nine-day visit after it's over. Thanks to all my guests. Please keep watching. We'll come back with other issues of Big Picture same time tomorrow.